people who claim to talk to God insane. It's sort of become a com commonplace observation that a person who talks to God is pious. If you, if you talk to God, you're pious. And if God talks to you, you're insane. The people naturally pray to God and Yeah, people naturally pray to God. And there's not much controversy about that, really. But if God talks to me, then people think I'm crazy. And in fact, the trouble with God talking to me is that it's unreliable. I, I did this or I did that because God told me to or because God wanted me to because he appeared to me in a dream because what I heard a voice now God may appear in a dream God may speak to you but it's unreliable because my heart is unreliable the heart is the, the receiving mechanism, as, as a radio is the receiver for a broadcast signal, the heart could be taken as the receiving mechanism for messages from God. And the trouble is that the, the mechanism is all screwed up. My heart is full of all kinds of junk, we all know it. Not that my heart is the reservoir of every pure thought, every pure desire, every pure Deter determination. The heart's full of every kind of junk. And then in that heart, I'm going to hear the voice of God and be able to reliably understand what he said, if he said anything to me at all. There's a, a reliability problem. That how do I know that I heard from God and how do I know I heard it right? So I hear this, you hear that, next guy hears the other thing. There was a, a case in a murder case, I think it was serial murders, quite a number of years ago in America where one man had murdered people and it, it came out in court that his dog had told him to. He was getting messages from his dog telling him to kill this person, kill that person. I forget whether God was involved or not, but his dog was telling him. In other words, he was mad, as the court also determined. He was mad. So he was hearing these orders, but his heart was unreliable. The reception mechanism was really broken. And that's the problem with divine inspirations from God telling me to do this, that, or the other thing. Therefore, the, the Vedic way is to understand what we should do and what we should not do by consulting the Vedic wisdom. The directions that have, have come from this divine source have a reliability to them that makes them worth following. The principles received from, from spiritual literature, from Bhagavad Gita, from Srimad Bhagavatam, and accepted by self-realized souls that we can take as, as a message from God. That we can take as a message from God. Or from other spiritual, other spiritual literature. We can take that as God's message. And that there are certain messages that you find everywhere. God says to love one another. God says to acknowledge his 
supremacy. God says to be satisfied with what's yours and not covet what belongs to the, the next guy. All these things are standards. So when our inspiration lines up with the wisdom of Vedic knowledge, then we can say that it's God is speaking to me. And when I get some idea that's wild, singular, unconfirmed by any kind of spiritual tradition or spiritual authority, then there's a good chance that I'm just mad. Or at least uncritically accepting a sort of whimsical thought or something else produced from a mind which is subject to errors, subject to mistakes, subject to whimsies, subject to fracture. The mind is a breeding ground of all sorts of cuckoo bird ideas. So, dhiras tachunamuyati, we can be bewildered by our wild minds, but a person who's thoughtful, who's sober, will not be bewildered. And therefore the process of spiritual advancement or the process of Krishna consciousness is to purify the mind. So that the mind actually becomes lined up with or contiguous with, consistent with a way of divine life, divine inspiration, or Krishna consciousness. So that what we do is inspired from within and confirmed by self-realized souls and standard books of Vedic knowledge. Then it's, then it's a goal, then it's reliable. Otherwise it may just be 